special population is pregnant patients. So female, for female patients of childbearing years, or considering pregnancy in the future, which biologic would you consider? Joe? So, uh, you know, this is a tough one. If you've got a patient that's a young patient, recently married, family planning, or uh, patients that are actually pregnant and cannot deal with their psoriasis, um, is there data that suggests that one medication is better than others? And luckily, we do have some pharmacokinetic data showing that sertilizumab, um, Simzia, is not, is designed in a specific way so it doesn't cross the placental border during pregnancy and also does not appear to be secreted in breast milk. So when I have a, pa a female patient in that window and their psoriasis needs a systemic agent, it's my absolute go-to. Um, you're also going to, you know, you'll come across um, patients that are on biologics that get pregnant also, um, other biologics. And, you know, when that happens, uh, luckily there are pregnancy registries and there's a lot of data of patients that have been pregnant and exposed to biologic agents and that medicate, and it's very reassuring and that data is accessible um, on the interweb or through your medical science <laughs> liaison. So it's pretty reassuring. But um, proactively, um, sertilizumab for me is my go-to based on the pharmacokinetic data and its specific structure. Everybody agrees? Agreed. Okay. <laughs> and then here's the, here are the clinical studies that showed uh, the pregnant patients that were exposed. I don't think we have the lactation data, but you can see the big blob of X's above um, showing the parent, um, the mother, and her blood level concentration. And then when you look down below the bar, that dotted line along the bottom, that threshold, um, you can see almost everyone except her blood exposed um, uh, C-section birth uh, was below the measurable um, level that would be quantifiable in terms of potentially exposing the fetus. So a really reassuring safety data showing that there's really no placental transfer of this particular agent. So this is an 18-year-old male with a history of severe atopic dermatitis present since age six months. The past medical history is significant for asthma, but otherwise healthy. Previous treatments include numerous topical corticosteroids, pimacrolimus, tacrolimus, chrysoboral, as well as numerous courses of oral prednisone, which Dr. Cohen said is a no-no, but we all do it anyways when we need to as a rescue. His current therapies include dupilumab, 300 milligrams every other week for the past six months, as well as topical clocortolone pivolate cream and clobetazole ointment. He rates his worst level of itch in the past 24 hours as a six out of 10, and about five, and that's about five days prior to each dupilumab injection. Which of the following treatment options would you consider? Would that be a dose escalation to 300 milligrams every week of dupilumab? Switching to Trelo, Kinumab, adding topical Rux, switching to Abro or Upatacitinib, any of the above or any other considerations. What do you guys think? Anybody want to take a crack at this one? The back. Oh, we've got one here. So adding topical Rux cream um, when the waning effect of the dupilumab comes in, and that bridges them to the two-week point. I think in, in this case, what unlike psoriasis, when you're, you're expecting dose escalation to work, you, you see a very slow failure of the drug over time, but there's, there's less... Um, uh, hyper variability with each dose. With eczema, your, your principal feedback is your NRX itch score, which moves very, very quickly, right? So this person is telling you that the first week is good, the second week's not good, right? Now, so ideally a dose escalation would work, it ought to work, 
but it's not always easy to get. But remember, Solo 1 and 2 <laughs> did weekly dosing. So you send New England Journal and Lancet articles about weekly dosing in, and they never read them anyway. Um, and so there was a point in the beginning I was able to get 10 or 20% of my patients on weekly dosing because they were so bad. But we didn't have rucks back then, and that's a perfectly reasonable choice. I think um, five is the right answer, right? A any of the above, because it's legit, right? They're all reasonably legit, and you can mix some of these up a bit. The one issue, as April mentioned with uh, some of her other um, slides, that there, there's a, a comment on the ruxolitinib label that is not a warning, but just a, a comment that it should not be used with therapeutic biologics or immunosuppressive drugs. So uh, a number of insurance companies, at least in the, in the Northeast, when they see a ruxolitinib cream prescription come, they cancel the dupilumab prescription. So you have to be kind of strategic when you write which one. Mm -hmm. um, and I write a lot of letters of medical necessity explaining that that's not their decision to make. It's not a contraindication. It is just a clinical um, observation. And there's no data to support that observation whatsoever. Let's see what the um, guidelines of care might look like that can help us there. But I think what you did was perfect, brilliant, um, to get that done. And from experience with time, how long has your patient been on dupilumab? So I would say the overwhelming majority of my weekly dupilumab patients are not on weekly a year or 18 months after they're doing it. Um, like there is a point it settles, it pulls out, and it's probably why when you look at the population of people who took dupilumab every other week and every week look the same, the problem is when you look at populations, you lose the individual quality there. And there are absolutely patients that do better on weekly than every other week. But I think with time, you'll probably get through that. Also, um, if there's isolated areas of stubbornness that are not the face, or even they are the face, you might consider patch testing them for allergic contact dermatitis, because there's no way you're going to be able to tell the difference between their eczema being resistant and they're touching something they're allergic to, right? And when you do patch test on uh, dupilumab, um, I'd say don't. Um, try to get them off dupilumab for as long as you reasonably can before you put the patches on. Because probably at least a third or to half of the allergens on the North American series that you would test to, you use a TH2 pathway to elicit dermatitis, and you're just going to blunt it. You'll get a false negative. So I have a question. If, if dose escalation, say that wasn't an option and we've, we've exhausted the topical options, would you go to Trello next in this patient or would you go to a Jack? But per personally, I probably would go to Trello first. Um, I have a patient who has been trained on the use of uh, injectable drug. Uh, they're familiar with the process. and. Um, I, have, I do not need to have a single additional conversation with them about adverse effects, right? It's, it's a screenless procedure. I just have to get it approved. Now, um, and I can't predict that the Trello won't work as well as Dupi. I've just had too much experience that I, I just can't tell who's going to react to what. Of course, if he's 18, um, and depends on the level of frustration. If this person is just flipping mad about it and they just, you know, they're going to college soon or, or they need to get clear, then I think it's okay to switch. Do I necessarily want an 18-year-old who's going to college? I don't know what their behavior will be like. I don't know what their lifestyle would be like going off on a, jack in, a new jack inhibitor at the time without me having time to observe them. I'm less comfortable with it, right? Yeah. But that's my level of neurosis, my own personal level of neurosis. And I got a lot of people on jack inhibitors. 
I think at 18, my, my concern would be long term. Obviously, we know this is a long yeah, term. How long are you gonna keep them you on? Know, how long do we keep them on the jack? And I think that's always a question we all have. It, it, it invariably, I don't think the answer can be 10 or 20 years. I just, the way I see the data, I don't see that. I don't have that concern so much about the dupe or the trailer right now, just from a mechanism, but there's not a lot of data on it. And we do get, with every academy meeting, with every EADV meeting, um, longer and longer safety data. I know we'll see new UPA data. And the several year data on UPA and ABRA is pretty good. It's pretty good. But there are people dropping out along the way. So all you're seeing is the observed data, and you're not seeing the reason always for dropout. They're disappearing, and we don't know why all the, t all the time. Yeah, I think it's also too early to see in the real world how the long-term jack patients are going to treat themselves in the wild. Are they going to go to PRN dosing, and because the mechanism of action and the onset of action is so quick, maybe they'll use them more in a PRN fashion than a regular every single day fashion, whereas the biologics, for atopic dermatitis anyway, um, they're, they're pretty much sticking to the Q2 to Q4 week dosing because they start to lose efficacy. So I think it's, you know, the time will tell, but it'll be interesting because potentially the uh, patients exposed to jacks can decrease their jack exposure based on how the disease responds to them dosing it on a PRN fashion, and which would be off-label. Well, but, but, but we do know that the intermittent dosing and the lower dosing is safer long-term and, and for any, all of the uh, uh, adverse effects of interest, it, it's better. There, there is data on um, scheduled and intentional drug withdrawal, right? As part of these um, studies, people uh, are re-randomized to placebo in the middle of them doing brilliantly well, all of a sudden their pill has got starch in it, and that's it. And if you give someone with severe disease, you pat a sitinib, and they clear, and in week 12 or 16, you put them on placebo, they will flare back to baseline within two or three weeks, four weeks. It is a very rapid recurrence. However, that's not what Joe was talking about. Joe's talking about all right, the person's on it six months or eight months, and they're clear, and they're missing a day or two here. Or the summer's good, they're going out to the beach, and they're clear in the salt water, and maybe they don't need it that much. And then there are times they flare and they need it a little bit more. I think that's a very practical use of these drugs and probably the safest use of them. Another question is, case here. TM is a 20-year-old female with a history of atopic dermatitis, presents with facial scale and crusting with erythematous patches and plaques on her arms with antecubital fossa involvement, also on the legs and trunk, and a total BSA is about 12%. She has excellent adherence to her cleansing and moisturizing routine. She's tried and failed mid-potency and high-potency topical corticosteroids, pimacrolimus, and chrysoboral. She's been unable to achieve adequate de disease control, and she she is tortured by her itch and cannot sleep. What options would you consider for this patient? Okay, so this brings me to another point. Remember, I, I, I said you should document your global assessment. It's so easy. Global assessment, three or four out of four, or one to two, just put it down. Put this body surface area down and do representative erythema scale crust and um, lichenification and for psoriasis, the exact same thing. Last thing to put down, numerical rating score for itch. On a scale from zero to 10, with 10 being the worst itch ever and zero being no itch, what is your score right now as you sit with me? Five. In the last 24 hours, what's the worst itch you felt? And that's a different number usually. It'll be like an eight, nine, or 10. If someone gives you an eight, nine, or 10, they are grabbing you by your lapels and shaking you to do something because it's, intol it's torture. So what might I do here? Uh, there's, there's a lot of options. I think there's a cho uh, option slide next, isn't there? But I was gonna add some more. So I think, number one, they weren't on oral, they weren't on systemic meds from my recollection, right? So just so you know, if you picked 
abracidinib and upadacitinib, I understand you and support you, but that is an off-label use of the drug. The, the, the drugs are for failures of systemic. These are not, by definition on their label, not first-line drugs. They can't be first-line drugs if you have to fail a systemic first. So the Dupi and the Trelo are completely reasonable first starts, but if you documented really this impact on quality of life, you happen to have a sample bottle of UPA or Abro, you could do that. But remember, it's 12% body surface area, and we have, by definition, a highly compliant patient with her topical care. Like, she's like the perfect patient, right? She cleanses with what you, you tell her to do. She's putting our moisturizer on. Why not use topical ruxolitinib here? It's under 20% total body surface area. We saw itch results within a day or two of starting the drug, right? And we didn't have it on there because when we created this scenario, topical rux, I don't even think was approved, but we kept this case in. And when I reviewed it, you know, like this week when we were talking about what we were gonna talk about here today, I was like, I think topical rux might be the perfect solution here right now. And you write that first and you say, look, I'm gonna give you this topical. I don't, I don't want you to get upset with me because the topicals have failed even though the superpones, but it's a completely different mechanism. But what we'll do is I'll give you this prescription now, fill it, and in a week or two, you message me in Epic and tell me what your numerical rating score for itch is and how you're doing. And if you're doing great, let's just run with it because you're a really good patient with this. But you do not need to come in again. You do not need to do anything. I will start the prior authorization the minute you message me and say this is not doing the job, and I'm going to probably start you on Dupil. I'm going to start you on Dupilumab first. It's the one I have the most experience with. It's the one right now that has the highest efficacy early on. Let's see what some of the newer ones come in. But that's what I would do, and it doesn't mean that. I think all those choices are okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Great discussion, David. Um, I, I, from ChatGPT. Yes, I did. I did. I say, how do I politely disagree with him, ChatGPT? And to start with, thank you, Dr. Cohen, for your uh, great no. advice on that. But <laughs> um, no. um, that's why it's great to have multiple people on the panel and. I, I probably would start with a systemic. She has 20% BSA. She's tortured by her itch and sleep. 20 or 12? 12. 12. Oh, 12. 12, 12. Still, yeah, 12. Okay. Um, she's tortured by the itch and sleep. So I, 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 I will use topical RUX as adjunctive to a primary systemic. I think it's actually not unreasonable to start her um, I, I agree with the Dupi choice or the Trelo. I actually don't think it's unreasonable to start her on, you know, Upadacitinib or Abro um, for a quick onset, quick relief. A uh, few things about that. So my interpretation of the label is maybe a little bit different because it says that, um, you know, the, for, for those who have uh, essentially failed systemic medications, comma, including biologics, which would make someone who has failed multiple courses of oral steroids eligible, yes. um, which means that you don't have to, uh, my, my interpretation is that you don't necessarily have to fail biologic to qualify for, for Abro or, or Upadacitinib. And I've gotten, um, in my neck of the woods, patients approved without them having, um, by having tried biologic yeah, no, uh, in but those she cases. she wasn't on prednisone, it's, I don't think, right? No. Okay. Oh, it's only topicals. But I get the point yeah. because she could have just as easily been last year on a medrol mm -hmm. dose pack. Yeah. Right, right. right. We could yeah. just yeah. add that. We should yeah. add that in next time just to add a little flavor to the, to the, to the conversation. Or we could yes. say she has not been on either way. One yeah. or the ha other. Yeah, ha right. Has or has, yeah. I, I think so a lot of people probably have some we should say have. systemic steroids in the, in the past. I think the harder choice for me, uh, if we go to the next slide, is is she's a 20-year-old, you know, female, right? Maybe on birth, you know, may or may not be on birth control. Although I think the latest data doesn't seem to suggest that birth control medications seem to significantly increase people's thromboembolic events on, on on oral jack inhibitors. 
Um, but you know, also family planning, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those things to be considered. Doesn't sound like she's actively planning. Um, so I think it's not unreasonable to s potentially to relieve her, um, you know, I itch symptoms and sleep decrements that, that she's tortured with will, will relieve the torture uh, and, uh, um, and with an oral medication, one of the oral jacks, and then potentially transition later onto a, a biologic medication once she is very comfortable. So, um, yeah, so, so I think I will, I will propose that alternative uh, method of treatment. And let me, let me check with my chat GPT again uh, uh, to I'm, say, what, what is a polite way of saying you thank you? Yeah. But I think my way is better. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, we were playing with chat GPT, and she's coming up with ways to disagree with me in chat GPT, and it, that's what it sounded like. I, but yeah, no, this, this is a great case, because we see it all the time. So the, the answer is there's not one exact right answer. This patient, you could start in the office at that moment with samples of trailokinumab, which is misspelled, but we'll get the B on there, so don't let it throw you off. Fix. It and magically it fix, fixed. Imagine, wow, that was wow. magic. <laughs> um, with trailokinumab or dupilumab, um, in the office right then and there, um, with sending them home with samples and a prescription for ruxolitinib cream, if you can get it. Or you could do what I, the other op, and I, I probably would do that. The other option would be if they were systemic hesitant for whatever reason, I would say here are samples and a prescription of ruxolitinib, use it aggressively for two weeks. I wanna see you back in the office in two weeks. Um, and at that point, um, if they're not clear enough, I can initiate therapy right then and there because this patient, patient is tortured. We don't have real, you know, it's in, in dermatology, there are very few really urgent scenes. But these atopics that are hot and miserable, this is someone that needs more urgent attention. And being able to not have to do pre-screening laboratory work and initiate therapy right then and there uh, is really a great option for this type of patient. I just say, I, I, I'm no fan of uh, topicals on large surface areas. I think that 12% was just around the edge of where I was ha ha comfortable with. The RUXO trials had an average of 10% body surface area and had easy 75 scores better than Dupi and Trelo and almost abro, and abro and had itch relief within the first few days. So it, it, you just have to be careful because she's someone who, if we're not watching, could try to bounce through an entire tube very, very quickly. So we have to say, <laughs> look, this tube's got to last you a month, right? Yeah. Because I'm not going to get it for you. Even though the label says you could use it in a week, what am I going to do in week two? You're not going to get another one. So, but I, I, I do want to, you know, emphasize the value of the clinical trial data on Ruxo. But if that was 20%, no. If it was 25%, no. We got to go to, you know, maybe give you a couple of samples so your face can get better quickly, but we got to go systemic on that. The one other point on that case was that she does not, uh, she does not have a history of asthma, right? So I think if you, if the patient does have asthma and you're going to go to Dupi or Trelo, you would want to go to, to Dupi in that case. My only thought on this case was that because of the more severe facial involvement, I think sometimes for me that might, if I'm going to go Dupi versus Trelo, I think I would go to Trelo Kinumab first in that patient, just with the severe facial involvement, just because yeah, of what could. we we see Completely with that reasonable. persistent facial involvement in, in our Dupi patients sometimes.